Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. We're back with another show, and today I got another bro who's going to talk to you about some pretty cool things. He's going to share his story, but first, our guest was somebody I met at the Protector's Summit, and you guys remember Rich Graham from a previous episode, and if you're interested in joining us, he will be there, as well as myself and many other men making men strong again. Go to protectwithelliot.com and use the promo code HULSE. 10 to get 10% off and then email me. You can email my wife actually, just don't uh, harass her. It's Colleen at ElliotHulse.com and we'll get you a solid plate, a solid place to stay near the retreat center. And so I would like to introduce our guest, Suresh. Am I saying it right, brother? You got it, you got it. Yep, Mad Haven, what a cool name too, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, when you're a kid growing up, you're like, man, I got a stupid name. Your friend, like, John Smith is like, everyone gets it right. You're like, man, I wish my name was John Smith. But then you get older, you're like, yeah, all right, I got a, I got a decent name. All right. Man, I know, because my best friends when I was a kid growing up was Michael and David. And I'm over here with Elliot, and I grew up in the 1980s, so E.T. was the big movie at the time. Oh, that's right. So everywhere I go, people are pointing their fingers at me and saying, Elliot. <laughs> Yeah, so names names can shape us, bro. Oh, yeah, they do, yeah. Very cool. Thank you for joining me here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? You have a great uh, story to share, and we're going to dive into some of what's going on in this diabolically disoriented day that we're living in, bro. Yeah, man. It's, um, it, it's wild to see what is going on, and my story is kind of the counter-narrative of what is happening today in our world you know i my my mother came to this country as an immigrant from india and barely had a handle on the language you know didn't have two nickels to rub together came here landed in uh, i think buffalo new york you know came through the 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 legal way and ended up you know living in uh, buffalo new york and um you know I soon migrated down to Staten Island, New York, where I was born, and she just came to this country. She was, you know, uh, seven brothers and sisters and wanted to have a better life for her children she knew when she started a family, and she knew that wouldn't happen in India at that time. So came here, you know, with nothing and started a life, uh, born on Staten Island, and she was working two, three jobs my entire childhood. And she thought that would be a good place for us to grow and, you know, have our little family. But in India, I bet. Yeah, a little bit better, a little bit better. Uh, then, um, so I have two older sisters and uh, six months, uh, well, three months before I was born, when she was six months pregnant with me, uh, my father left. And she, so your mom was, was a single Indian woman here. And how did she meet your dad? Uh, arranged marriage. Is that right? Arranged marriage. From what I understand, you know, of course, you know, there is, you know, he's the father of, you know, my two sisters. And I believe he's the father of me. I, I don't go down that road. But and uh, it was, a, you know, to that man, it was an arranged marriage. It was all family arranged, you know, which still happens today in India. Mm hmm. And um, what are your thoughts on that arranged marriage? You know, every culture is different. Right. And uh, I respect the culture and I respect how that came about. That was really about land and property. That's how it came about. The arranged marriage. And then, you know, there's the dowry system. So that's it was really you know, you're, you know, you, our daughter is going to marry your son and then that's going to kind of help merge the families and that's going to give our daughter a piece of your 
property or acreage you own and some property rights and maybe you have cattle and you you know we have this so that's it was more of like a business I don't even deal. think we're that far removed from that in western culture I think this whole idea of romantic marriage probably came about you know 2 300 years ago Yeah yeah mm-hmm. the, the marriage for love and the marriage Right it's yeah. sort of a newfangled idea It's not that old and uh you know and like I said there's it still happens today in many cultures and i think we see it it's under a veil here in america but i think we all know that there are certain situations with some of these very high level families where they kind of make it up you know i don't want to say uh they don't force it but they kind of say, hey, you got to marry someone of a certain stature. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, the so-and-so girl, the daughter of this guy who's this billionaire, this is someone you kind of want to marry and you want to yeah. stay in this circle. Um, I had a friend uh, growing up, you know, a few years back, I met through some of my business networks, and he essentially said he couldn't just marry some girl right? because of the way his family was and the wealth they had. They're from New York. And it was kind of like he had to marry a girl from one of these like four or five families in that like New York City Hamptons area or else it was like not going to be it was going to be frowned upon by his family. Right. And I was like, wow. The the pendulum has swung so far, so much so that the parents aren't even given a say with regard to who they bring into their family. And I know that it's it's Christian tradition and it's Western tradition for a young man and a young woman to get their parents' permission at least, right? I mean, I would be grateful for the young man who wants to court and marry my daughter to come and ask my permission and then actually take that seriously, right? Yeah. Because you, of course, if it's wealth and it's you know land and stuff like that, that's one thing. But um, I think it's good for parents to have a hand in who their children marry. That's just my personal opinion and it's tradition. So, uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that with us. Bro. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. I think that, you know, as parents, we've seen a lot more. Right. We know the world, you know, your background, you've met a lot of people. You've met some good people. You've met some bad people. Right. You know, you've met some honest people. You've met some dishonest people in your time, you know, me as well. So we have a good radar on that that maybe our children don't yet. We could see some of those red flags that maybe they don't quite see yet because they don't know. They don't have the time on earth to notice these things. Right. And that's why it's important to say, you know, I talked to some friends and they're like, oh, yeah, my daughter's going on a date or, you know, going out with her boyfriend. And I'll say, I say, oh, so what's he like? Like, I don't really know. I really have met him. You know, he comes to the house, picks her up and they just go out. I'm like, that makes me cringe. I'm like, what? Your your daughter's sixteen, and she's going out with some boy. And is he kind? Is he respectful to what's her? What's his intentions? Yeah, like what is he like? What's his like family like? Do do they go to church? Are they like? Do they believe in hard work? Like what? Like you don't know who your daughter is out with right now. Yeah, you know he could be some complete jerk, and um. It, so, but that's kind of become normalized, right? In a lot of ways, the you know when we were growing up, there was no going and getting a girl from a house without knocking on the door. Oh yeah, even calling in the phone. I got it. Speak to the dad. Hi, Mister So and So. May I speak with? That's right. That's right. There was no no Snapchat. Yeah, there was no. So it was it was the right way to do it. But that's all been removed now. And now it's just like, you know, the sitting at the kitchen counter, the text comes in that he's here. Okay, he's here. All right, I'll see you later, Mom. And, I'm like, and I see that happen in these households with my friends. I'm like, what is what just happened right now? Right. Why didn't that man come to the door, open the door, shake your hand? You're my friend. You're my boy. He maybe see me too. Right. You know, like bad boys. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking right. about, man. You know, shake your hand. Hey, hello, Mr. So-and-so. Uh, how are you this evening? Okay. Uh, I would always ask, what time does she need to be home? 
because there's a time that she would tell you she needs to be home, but then there was the actual time. So I would say, you know, what time would you like her home by? Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You know, that's how I was raised. Right. And I said, okay, yeah. Go walk her out to the car. Open the door for her. Don't that the wheels of that car don't move until she has her seatbelt on. And then we go, you know, and you don't speed away like some thug with the music blasting. You you know, just handle yourself like a man. That's how I was raised by my single mom. And I, that's like a foreign thing today. It's completely foreign. So your parents had an arranged marriage. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, then what happened? How did? Why did your dad leave? Or the story, what were the red flags that weren't noticed? Or the story I have received, like I said, I you know, there's it's a bit cloudy. Yeah. Um, and I don't press my mom on it for obvious reasons. Um, so it was the come here to kind of start the life, have children, whatever. But that wasn't told to him in India. So, so your dad's Indian too. The the man who's the father to my two sisters that I, I yes, he's Indian. Um but like I said there's some cloudiness around yeah. I, possibly my father too, uh, allegedly. I've heard that, that you know. Indians have the least amount of divorce. They do. They do. And believe it or not, they still have the highest amount of, you know, um uh arranged marriage. So there's something to be said for all these relationships, right. you know, my mother and father included, that had this arranged marriage, and they were like the point zero one percent where it didn't work, and it was an ex, you know extenuating circumstance where she left the country, where that's not wasn't the norm back then to leave your family right. in India and leave the grandparents and leave the parents. Like everyone kind of just, they live next door to each other. So in the that village. mantle wasn't there of protection perhaps. Yeah. So um, the store, from what I know, I don't, like I said, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know where he is. You know, never met him a day in my life uh, that he went back to India. That's what I'm told. So she remained here and said, well, I'm going to do it on my own. She was very outside the lines of what you would think, uh, a little, you know, submissive Indian woman would be, you know, she was like, no, I'm, I'm going to have my own career. I'm going to have my own job, my own money. And so she built a life for us, uh, on Staten Island, New York, which was 99.99% Italian That's right. at the time. And it was like the Sopranos on steroids, you know, and there we were, you know, this little Indian family. Did you know? they call you Munyon? No. Okay. <laughs> I got to tell you. I got people, called out a couple of times. People ask me how it was. And I got to tell you, once I was kind of with the kids, once I was in with the kids and the parents saw that I was a respectful young man, uh, that changed the complete view of me by them. Uh, however, the people who didn't know our family in the area, in the neighborhood, um, didn't feel that way. So ultimately, uh, when I was about in second grade, uh, the uh, there's no really word for it, but the the abuse and terrorism got so bad we had to sell. We had to move. We we couldn't stay there anymore. Damn, really? It culminated with uh, a brick coming through the front window of our house, followed by a quarter stick of dynamite. They call it a blockbuster yeah. that exploded on the sofa right next to my where my sister was sleeping, and I was on the adjacent sofa. And once that happened, like there were things leading up to that stuff done to my mom's car, stuff done to the, you know, the house. But once that brick came through the window and that thing exploded next to my sister, um, that was when my mom realized, OK, it's like I can't fight this anymore. She would call the police for things happening and the police just wouldn't show up. This wouldn't show up, you know. So uh, she realized, OK, you know, this is it. So she put up a good fight. Ultimately, like she built that house herself, you know, as a single woman, you know, she built a new construction house there and had, you know, every, you know, intention of keeping it. We never sold the house. We kept the house. And that's the house she continues to live in now. I bet the neighborhood's a little bit more tame these days. A little bit more tame, a little bit more diverse. You grew up in what, the 1980s? Yeah. Yeah, the 80s. Man, so things have changed quite a bit in the culture since then. Yeah. 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 But you face some dead on racism. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, my story was we moved to New Jersey, and once again, my mom focusing on education and not so much social 
moved us to this small little mile by mile town uh, in the middle of New Jersey called Spotswood, and uh, not too far from Rutgers University, and because it had good schools, blue ribbon schools, and she said, yeah, education is key. You know, her, right. all her children were going to become doctors, and uh, that was the thing in the Indian culture. If you don't become a doctor or an engineer or something, you're a loser. You're just you're 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 throwing your life away. So, uh, you know, that was a path I was on. So uh, but I was in this all white town and then it dropped into this school system that was all white. And then there was me. And I'm like, oh, man. So like 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 I'm like the little dark skinned kid running around with the big curly hair speaking like Tony Soprano from Staten Island, if you could imagine that. And people were like, what is this creature (laughs) that just moved into this town? You know, very blue collar town. Uh, And people were nice generally, but you could tell they weren't used to, you know, someone different in. And, you know, for the most part, you know, people were kind, people were friendly. But, you know, you had your little teachers here and there that kind of like, you know, looked at you and treated you a little different. I didn't realize it then so much, but now when I look back at it, I realize, oh, that, like, I remember, like, kids having birthday parties and, like, there were cupcakes made and everyone in the class had a cupcake except me. And they're like, oh, sorry, Suresh, we don't have enough cupcakes for you. When you're a kid, that kind of... <clears throat> that stings, yeah. but you're not thinking about how, why that happened. Right. You're just upset you didn't get a cupcake, right. you know, because, like, I like cupcakes and you're like, all your friends are eating cupcakes. When I look back at that now, I realize that, oh, oh, I got it. Okay, yeah. I see, you know. So the I didn't experience the pain then. I experienced the pain like, you know, 30 years later when I was like, oh, wait a <laughs> That's why I'm traumatized. Yeah, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, hmm, you know. So different things like that happen. Different things. You know, when I was in high school, there was, you know, a situation with a teacher who, you know, clearly just didn't like me because I was – uh, I had good grades. I was senior class president. Wow. I was I voted senior class president, uh, graduated <clears throat> near the top of my class, <clears throat> not at the top, but, you know, near the top. And I did very well. But, there, you know, there was those teachers that you could just tell, man, it was like when you when you realize I don't know what I'm doing and then you realize, oh, it, what else? You know, whenever when you remove everything else and, you know. Try to, you know, throw me in detention, try to do this, try to do this. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, man, like, but when you're a little bit older and like I was in high school at that time, that's when it started coming around. Like there was a situations where like, you know, this one girl was, you know, interested. Of course, everyone in the school is white. And this one girl liked me. She wanted me to like go to some dance with her. And I had no intention of even going. Her friends were like, oh, you should ask her, you know, whatever. And I was like, oh, I don't really even like her. But OK, so finally I did. And she was all excited. Next thing you know, she went home and told her parents. And then that was it. Like it was done over. Now, this is people I'd been to their home. I'd been to their home. They'd talk to me, the parents, friendly, whatever. But the minute their daughter liked me like that, and it was no longer a school project, you know, where, hey, you got to come over and hang out. It was it. It was a wrap. Maybe they wanted a, a arranged marriage. Maybe they did. Yeah, you know. And I'm <laughs> like, mm, I, so So that's when things started to hit home, you know. I remember there was this one teacher. I don't know what the heck she taught. She taught, like, computers or something. Her name was uh, Karen Venezia. And, uh, like, like one day I was like, I was, the principal came and was like, oh, you're in detention today after, after uh, school. I'm like, wait, what, why, what happened? He said, oh, the teacher said that you called her, uh, the B word, a B I T C H. And I said, when? And so oh, well, after class today. And I said, um, I know that never happened. And there were like three people there that, also vouched for me they were like they literally told the principal they're like that didn't happen we were all there and he was like yeah i'm sorry she said it did so uh you got you got detention and like i had to like miss a basketball game or something and i'm like why would someone do that to me like it didn't like it didn't resonate with me like then down the road i was like oh i like i see like these little things that occurred along the way that when they are happening as a young man you're confused and then that, when I understood why they were happening, I got angry. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, man, like this wasn't right. And now this is this wasn't a moral person. There was all kinds of rumors that this woman was sleeping with students and stuff like that. Oh, boy. So this wasn't not this was not like a moral person. Yeah. 
but for some reason with me. So I dealt with those things all along, but I kind of was oblivious to it. You know, I kind of navigated it and um, then went off, you know, pre-medical program and, uh, you know, going to be a doctor, like my mom said. So I was in the program, uh, ended up in New York City uh, and, uh, you know, biochemistry major, uh, just doing what I needed to do to become a physician. And then 9-11 happened. And, uh, how old were you? Uh, I think I was about like 20 or 21. I think you and I are about the same age. Yeah. I'm, uh, 43. Yeah, me too. All right. And, um, so. Man, that's amazing. Cause I grew up on Long Island, not too far from Staten Island, obviously, mm -hmm. but I grew up in a mixed neighborhood on Long Island. So I kind of. It was challenging, but I had a lot of black kids around me. The issue with me was that nobody knew what I was. Uh, this kid is mixed. So the white kids were confused. and well, I was confused, according to them. Yeah. Uh, but the white kids had an issue, and not even the kids, the parents. And then the black kids, same time. It was like, who is this blue-eyed nigga? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's almost worse. It is, it's, man. It's almost worse. It was tough. Because you you're on no one's side. No friends you in know? that way. What are your thoughts on like reverse racism today, where it almost seems as if white people are getting demonized, uh, I guess, as a result of the history? Man, I saw this thing the other day that... So when you have been... I could always tell when the people who are screaming on social media and whatever are talking about racism. I could tell the people and even some of the black people that are you know talking, especially the black people that are talking about racism... I could always tell the black people that are talking about racism that have never been a victim of racism. Right. You can always tell because they have no concern when they see racism in any other spectrum. Because right. when you have been a true victim of it, you are appalled by it when it happens to anybody. You're not just appalled by it when it happens to someone who looks like you. So... I saw something the other day where uh, in Pennsylvania, this is a true story, uh, in Pennsylvania there was a school board, and on the school board there was all kinds of different people, men, women, whatever, but, uh, and this man was on the school board, he joined the school board, he graduated Penn State, degree in like mechanical engineering, own, uh, is the owner of multiple U.S. patents, and has a special needs child has multiple kids in the school district. He had a special needs child that wasn't getting the attention that uh, he or she deserved and said, I want to change this. I want to make sure that parents of other special needs children, we have programs in place so their children thrive. So he joined the school board and joined the school board and did very well and brought some good change to the school district and ran for school board president. And the was pretty much the front runner to be president based on his accomplishments. The school board voted that he can't be president because he is a straight, what they called cis white male. And they said him being the only cis white male, on the, they couldn't elect him president as the only cis white male on the board. All right, merit has nothing to do with it. It's and so, your color. But in the same breath, the woman explaining why that guy, who, great guy all around, couldn't be, you know, spoke his accomplishments, said, we're going to give it to this lady here. Right. And she has some great accomplishments that she was, she's going to do a great job. So in the same breath, she said, her accomplishments, but his accomplishments meant nothing because he was a cis white male, and they said that would not look good for optics, mm. and that was not the message they wanted to send. Like now, the school board has to send yeah. mess message to who? Who are you sending a message to? Right. They and this is like a righteous racism. Th that like it is, won't be questioned. It won't be questioned. It is outright racism. It's and really. It's also it's also sexuality based. Like so, right. if you took something away or prevented something from going, some kind of benefit from going toward a person who is gay, you would be destroyed. Right. Right. So if you said, "I'm not going to give you this opportunity," although you have the accomplishments, I'm not going to give it to you because you're gay and you're uh, black. People, you would 
you you'd be they, you'd be shot. They'd be like, well, <laughs> like you know, whatever. Right. But they say you're white and you're straight. So I'm, we're taking this away from you, although you have the accomplishments, and we're going to give it to this person who doesn't have the accomplishments because she's a girl or she's a woman or because she's trans or because she's a lesbian or right. whatever. To me, as a victim of someone uh, because the color of my skin to have things have had taken away from me, I see what happened to that white man, and I'm like, that's wrong. Right. That's wrong. I know how he feels. I've been there. And that's wrong. Wrong is wrong. Despite his skin color, his sexuality, wrong is wrong. And anyone looking at that should say that's wrong too. And that's the epitome of reverse racism, but it's not called out. It's not called out. It's actually rewarded. What are your thoughts on affirmative action? You know, you can you can settle the affirmative action discussion very easy and i saw this i saw this happen i'm a big college football fan and i know you played football that's right and college football is a big money maker for these universities <clears throat> there are all these people who are screaming about diversity and inclusion and everything on the college campus affirmative action we got to have a certain number of white kids certain number of asian hispanic but black what all this stuff, certain amount of female, now it's going to be a certain number of trans, this, that, safe spaces, all this stuff has to be like this melting pot, right? Who's the number one football team now? Georgia, right? I think Georgia. I think Maybe. Yeah, I Georgia, really Georgia, Bu Georgia Bulldogs. I think they're the number one team. <clears throat> Go to all these kids and all these professors that are talking about equality and affirmative action and all this stuff in the workplace and all this stuff. Put a photo of the football team in front of them and say, y'all are going to the championship game in a couple of weeks. However, look at the makeup of the football team. It's all black. Right. It's all black. All of you people screaming diversity and inclusion and all this stuff, all you woke idiots that are all about all this garbage. Let's make the football team equal. Oh, what we want to win. That's exactly what they said. <laughs> that there's a video. Yeah. I'm gonna send it to you. And that's what they all said. They said, Whoa, wait, no. And they were like, Why? No, let's get a couple of Asians. Right. Let's get a couple of Hispanics. Some women on there. Let's get a couple of trans. You know, let's get let's make it equality for football. Come on. This is and they all said, No, 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 no. We don't want that. Why not? Because we want to win. Right. And they all, in the same breath, the same ones that said equality, inclusion, diversity. Well, what what should the football team be based on? Well, skill. It should be the best players. Right. Oh, so when it comes to the football team, it's okay that they're all black because it should be the people who are the strongest, the fastest, and the best players. But would they do that with like an all-white sport perhaps? Like it was hockey or something. Where would the outcry be? You don't see it. You don't see it. Now, there was, uh, I think, some MSNBC reporter. She just got fired, actually. Her name was Tiffany Cross. Uh, she was saying that the NFL is racist because it's all white owners and pr predominantly white coaches and all black players on the field. And for one reason or another, she said that's racist. But in the same breath, she said that the NHL is also racist because it's predominantly white players and that the NHL needs more inclusion and needs more black players. But when you have a division or a sport that has a lot of black players and some white players, NFL has some, you know, obviously, you know, a small oh, yeah. percentage. Uh, quarterbacks, quarterbacks, you know, <laughs> kickers, you <Right>. know, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's facts. Uh, you know, so that that's fine. But then over here, this, this so it's like, okay, what's right? Is everything racist now? NFL right. too black, NHL too white. Right. So it, it's almost like they're going against their own narrative, right. you know? And like, I've seen some great black hockey players that are phenomenal. What do we need to do? Should anything be done? Well, I'll tell you this right now. If black kids growing up would rather play football and basketball because that's what they like more right? and they don't care for hockey, I don't think we should force 
anyone yeah. to play any sport. That would be real diversity. What they're trying to do is fabricate a diversity. Real diversity is, guess what? We're different. We have different strengths, talents, and abilities. Let that play out naturally and enjoy the diversity as it naturally is. Yeah, and for some reason, that's not welcome. Now it's like it's this forced thing. They have to force it on people, whether you like it or not. We're going to now make a biologically born man swim with the women and went from rank 432 to rank number one. And we're forcing that on you. And Do you me, think that we will ever come to our senses? Or, or in other words, yes, we must. But how long until we begin to say no to this disorientation, this craziness that we're living, living under? It doesn't happen until it starts affecting and having an adverse effect on the people who are championing it. So all these woke politicians that were defunding the police over the last couple of years, the only thing that made some of them change their mind was like when they got carjacked or right. they got robbed or their house got broken into. All of a sudden then it starts like, oh, hold, hold on a second. I think we need some more cops on the street here. You know, so... I think you have to see that happen, and a you know, pendulum always swings. Yeah, right. And this happened. I see. I saw a news report yesterday of a young woman who's a skateboarder. I think that was her sport, and she lost uh, something like fifty thousand dollars to a identifying woman, and so she decided to protest. Mm -hmm. And so until some people decide that they're not going to play the game anymore, I think we're going to continue to we're going to deal with this. Yeah, and there has to be. You know, there's always. I, I use this term not in the, the the note in the text that most people have, but there has to be a little bit of an uprising where people just put their foot down and say, no, 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 this is not OK. It's not OK for a man to go into the locker room with my daughter. That's not OK. I don't care if that man woke up one day and said, I'm a girl and I'm going to be a girl. Uh, I think I'm a girl. I'd like to be a girl. You know, I dream about being a girl. And now he's going to go in the locker room with our daughters. Like, no, that like. At, like it's it's at the point where people are starting to speak up a little bit because you know a little while ago it was if you spoke up you were immediately crushed now a few more people are starting to speak up and they're getting a little bit of pushback and then soon it'll be a larger contingent of people because as time goes on more of it hits home to different people and then people start coming around the corner and saying Oh, okay, because we already saw the one story of this guy that was in some girl's bathroom or some girl's locker room, and he was trying to do something, and it turned into a thing. Right. And now it's like, okay, hold on a second. So ebbs and flows. I just think that this is – I always ask people, and we talked about this when we were – there's a lot of people who are seeing these things that are saying, this is crazy. Like, this makes no sense what is happening right now but like we have our we have a completely unsecured southern border we have a nut job in russia talking about using nukes we have veterans who fought for our country freezing to death on our streets starving and we have americans for the first time in we can't remember how long who can't afford to heat their homes or buy groceries and now we're having to put utility bills on credit cards at 20 something percent interest. That's happening right now. They're like you're like, "Oh, that would probably happen in like, you know, some, you know, third world country." No, it's happening right now in America. While all that's happening, you have our administration celebrating the passing of like some some bill that was already in effect 10 years ago. Right. It was the gay marriage bill. Right. Gay marriage has been allowed. Obama put that in place. Right. But they were celebrating it yesterday at the White House with the drag queen and some transgenders and having a drag show for children at the White House celebrating the gay marriage bill. But Obama put that in place. Gay people have been able to get married anywhere in this country since Obama was here. But they're making it a new celebration and a new thing to take everyone's mind off of all the other stuff that's going on. 
keep the people blind. Keep the people blind. Make, oh, look, we're, we're doing something. And to me, I look at that and I say, how, how is this happening? But more importantly, why is it happening? Because everything happens mm-hmm. for a reason. So what are your thoughts on that? Where did this begin? Because it seems like a slippery slope. And over the past 100 years, we've had so-called revolutions, right? Sexual revolution, feminist revolution, even the uh, civil rights movement. Um, are these pinpointed spots where this slope began, it's slippery slide down where we are right now? And um, you know, who's behind it and why? I think part of it's a phenomenal question. I think about that all the time. I think that part of this was born from too good of times. Mm. But I also think there's something going on in the background that in order to defeat, if, if you and I had to like face 50 guys and you and I are looking at each other and we're like, we got to go against these 50 dudes. And we're like, well, this is not going to work. We got to come up with a plan. And our only way out of here is to get through those 50 dudes. The plan is never going to be, bro, let's just run at them. Straight on. Let's straight on and let's fight. We know it's not going to work. Right. We know that's not going to work. We got to create some kind of confusion. So we got to create a plan. The best plan would be division. Right. That would be the best plan is to somehow divide them into smaller groups because we might not be able to take on 50, but if we can divide them into 10 groups of five, we could take on you and I could take on five one at a time. We right. could. Especially if they're fighting with each other. But let's go another step further. If we're taking on these five and these five over here and these five over here happen to notice, what are they going to do? They're going to come in and help. They're going to come in and help. But- if these five and these five and these five, these 15 people out of the 50 have beef or have some division or look at those five guys and be like, oh, well, those are those guys over there. Yeah. They're not going to come help. So you and I are going to take those five on. We're going to beat them and then we're going to move on. And now all these all the fives are all they all have different like different things that they're following, different things they believe in, because something from the outside put, pitted them all together, man. It'll take some time, but we'll just hit group of five at a time, group of five at a time, and then soon we'll beat the 50 and we'll be able to get out and get to freedom. We'll be able to we'll be able to do whatever we want. We'll be able to do whatever we want with those 50 people. So I think that's kind of and if if you don't see the basics of war, right? And the basic and the study of battles, that's going back i don't know how long in time where you're looking at how do you take on a bigger army divide and conquer so are you suggesting that we're at war there is a war that is happening but it's not the definition of war that you and i know and that most people know people hear war and they think tanks and you know you know jets and you know boat you know you know ships out at the sea and bombs exploding and things like that we're in 2022. You know, the the bombs of the past now are little tactics because you can't drop bombs because you, you'll get wiped off the map. So what do you have to do? You have to do little things here and there to divide and break down. You have to do very, very small strategic things. That's why we're in the situation we're in, I believe, because I think it's a systematic inch by inch by inch breakdown divide first create the different divisions and then it's to the point where you almost don't even need to now you and me go after each group of five if we are able to divide the group of 50 into 10 groups of five and then we're able to create enough angst and anger and animosity between them it gets even one step better it's not like okay let's go we're going to get that group of five today and we're going to fight and it's going to be two on five, but it's going to be a good fight. We're going to be able to take it. No, if we're smart, we step back and start just sprinkling things in. And next thing you know, we're like, this group of five is fighting this group of five. 
and they're fighting each other and eventually they're going to someone's going to go down so who is it that's subverting our culture and turning us against one another you know people talk about oh it's this guy over here it's this billionaire guy here it's this guy over here um ultimately the way i was i believe when you see this level of of i call it evil sure it's the devil Right. It's the devil. And how did he get such a foothold on Western civilization? I think because of the ease we had. We didn't have any angst for so long. You know, post 9-11, there was angst. But it brought unity. It sure did. It brought unity. Long Island, Staten Island, every bridge you went across had flags, American flags, right? That's a racist flag now. Now it's racist. Now all of a sudden it's racist, right? right? But there was unity. People in the streets of all colors, ages, everything. It was about America. We were one country. We had a defined enemy, right? right? We knew who it was. And that faded. It faded over time, right? And the the terms Al Qaeda and ISIS didn't sting as much five years after 9-11, 10 years after 9-11, you know. So Whoa, so much so now that we our president's giving them weapons. Right. Right. So if you went back in time and told people one year after 9-11 that one day we are going to give ISIS, Al-Qaeda, terrorists, billions of dollars of military equipment and arsenal. We're going we're gonna to leave it there and relinquish it to them. And one day, the president of the United States is going to be removed from a platform to talk to all the people. But one of the leaders of ISIS is going to remain free on that platform to communicate with people. They would look at you and they would instantly throw you in a mental hospital because in 2002, if you said that to someone, they would have said, come get this guy. This guy's crazy. He's crazy. There's no way that would ever happen. But now fast forward to what? 2021. You have the leader of ISIS on Twitter talking away and you had the president of the United States banned from Twitter. You have billions of dollars in equipment left behind and you have people here meanwhile in this country in this country they're talking about all this stuff that's going on in this country all these people oh elon musk he bought twitter he could he could have done this 91 billion to the ukraine 91 billion dollars to ukraine people were saying elon bought twitter for 40 something 44 billion 46 billion and all these woke people were like yeah, he could, you know how much uh, climate change he could stop with? You know how many food, starving people he could done with that? All this stuff. They, they all had a lot to say. About him. $91 billion to Ukraine, and no one knows where the money went. So what are your thoughts on the pushback, especially in Europe? So, for example, recently uh, one of the parliament members, I don't know if it was a president or how they do it, but in Spain, said that, yes, we'll take Ukrainian refugees, just not Muslims. Yeah. See, you got to now look at that and see this is where the divide is happening. Because when you put people into compromise situations, they don't want to look bad, but they may not want to bend the knee completely. So now what what's happening? Now people are looking at that guy and saying, he's a racist. Right. He's a racist. That guy is saying... I'm saying we're willing to do some goodwill. However, we have some concerns about it's really Muslim extremists, right? And that's who, like when Trump said, we have murderers and rapists and drug dealers coming across the southern border. And everyone said, he said that about everyone. Right. No, he's not saying that about everyone. He's not saying about the, the mother carrying her infant across the border. He was saying that of a thousand people that come across the border... Maybe a hundred are coming with bad intentions or involved with something sinister, or maybe even 50. Who knows? But out of a thousand, if a hundred or 50, whatever, are bad people, you, you want to stop that because this is our country. We want to keep it safe. 
people are saying the same thing. We'll, we'll take people, but we got to do some vetting. We want to do some vetting. We don't want to bring in extremists of any kind. And I know that message can sound bad, but some of these countries don't have the strength that we have. And if an element comes into the country that is a dangerous extremist, like Trump said, we don't, you know, fine if people are coming in from the southern border that are running away from like true, like a uh, hard situation and they're coming here as refugees. That's one thing. But if you're like drug runners and human traffickers and you're coming in bringing drugs and stuff to the, no, no, we don't want that. We don't want that. But what was the message? He was xenophobic. Trump doesn't like Mexicans. And like, right. he was like, but that wasn't what he said. Like no one wants danger coming in to their home. No one like you would say, Elliot, I'm going to I'm going to have a party at your house. Do you mind if I use your house? And you say, yeah, man, I got I got my house. You could use it. How many people? Oh, man, it's probably like 40, 50 people. And you say, OK, we'll, we'll hang out in the back. I'm going to be hanging out with my wife and kids. We're going to be in the back part of the property and you guys can use this for your event or whatever. But at some point you would say, bro, I'll let you use my house. You're my boy. You know, you're going to get it catered. You're going to be doing everything fine. Okay. But this is my house where I am with my family. This is my, my kingdom, my domain, my property. Of the 50 people you're bringing here, you just got to make sure everyone's on the up and up. I don't want no criminals, no child molesters, no drug dealers, no idiots, no knuckleheads. I don't want any of that coming onto my property, being in near my home, in the vicinity of my children, my family. And I would respect you for that. I would not, in response to you saying that to me, I would not say, what do you, you don't like my friends? Right. What? Well, you, you don't think I got good judgment? You know, like, I wouldn't say that to you. I would never say that to you. I would say, right. I, I respect you, man. Yeah, no, I'm not bringing. So if we eliminate the criminal aspect of it, what are your thoughts on those that propose that this cultural and racial mixing that is uh, so pushed in many ways is, in fact, a form of warfare itself? It is. You can't, you can't. You can't say it's not. For whatever reasons it's happening, the people who are supporting the flow, I think it's over 2 million now uh, uh, of uh, undocumented coming across the southern border. These same people would never let, and we saw it happen on Martha's Vineyard. They right. would never let a single one of these people in their, most of them would never let them in their home for an evening. Now we saw it in Martha's Vineyard. All these rich people, not too far from where you and I grew up, all these wealthy people, big homes. And at the time when that happened, all the homes were empty, right? They had their help monitoring their homes. How many rich people said, called up the peace person who was watching over their home and said, hey, hey, let let five of these guys stay there for the night. You know, make sure, go, go to the grocery store, get some food for them. And until we get this thing situated... Let, you know, we got we got eight bedrooms. Let five of them stay in our home. Right. And nobody did that. No one did that. Are those people uh, racist or are they hard hearted? No one will call them racist. No one will call them hard hearted. No one will call them anything. They're the same people who are on Twitter and Facebook and whatever calling Donald Trump and whoever else a racist for what he's saying at the southern border. Mm -hmm. Those same people did nothing on Martha's Vineyard. So that's the story. But. The deeper question is, why are they allowing it to happen if we know that we wouldn't even allow that in our home? We wouldn't allow that in our home. Why are we allowing it in our country? What's the reason to let 2 million plus people who are undocumented, and it's from a, 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 an array of countries. It's not just South America. It, there's an array of countries, people coming through the southern border. Um why is it happening? So you have to look at what's the net effect. What's going to happen? Right. What's going to happen? So it's not going it, to, the question isn't what's going to happen a year from now, because it's already been happening now for almost two years. The question is what's going to happen 20 years from now? Because that's how long these societal shifts take to occur. Sometimes it's 
a generation. Right. Sometimes it's half a generation. Think about since we were in high school, how much has changed since we, it's probably, probably creeping on 25 years or so since we've been in high school, right? right? So how much has changed? Quite a bit has changed. So that's how long these long-term changes take to occur. I studied biology and biochemistry. You should see the evolution of certain things biologically, how long it takes. So most people are still going around right now like, oh, everyone's talking about the southern border, southern border, no big deal, southern border. You know, we're walking around downtown here, no problem. We're not really seeing it or feeling it. It takes time. The question is, what are we going to see? How is it going to affect us? How is it going to affect our schools? How is it going to affect our government? How is it going to affect our infrastructures? One of the things that New York City Mayor Eric Adams, who was a big proponent uh, and the mayor of Baltimore, uh, I think, uh, and D.C., uh, was another one, Muro Bowser. They were all about, you know, sanctuary cities, all about sanctuary cities. You're welcome here. We're not racist. We're not like the bad guy. Bring them all in. Bring them all in. Bring them all in. We're, we're, we support the open border or whatever. After just a few hundred people showed up, what happened? They're on the news saying our school system can't take this. Our, our, uh, our you know, housing system can't take this. Um, our, you know, our food for the, you know, for the families. We mm-hmm. don't have the, the police. The, the police can't control this. They're, they're now, now all of a sudden, like, the, there's people sleeping on the streets. All of a sudden, so because it looks good to be on the stage when you're running for office to say, we're a sanctuary city. We welcome everyone from all countries, all refugees. And if you say otherwise, you're a bad person. Mm-hmm. But then just a, literally a few months later, you're on the same stage. And now you got into office. And now you're on the same stage saying, we can't. We need more money. We, we can't do this. We can't handle this. We can't handle this. The police are overwhelmed. The school teachers are overwhelmed. Everyone's overwhelmed. And this is, this is a problem. And we need some more money from the government. And now when they say they need money from the government, where does that money come from? Right. It comes from us. Right. It comes Taxpayers. From all, it comes from all of us. Right. Now, if it doesn't come from us, it comes from the government printing more money. Right. And when the government prints more money, what happens? You and I are paying more at the grocery store, at the gas station, at Home Depot. So it comes from us one way or another, whether they say, hey, Elliot Suresh, we got this issue. You know, we need some more tax dollars out of you. We're going to take a little bit more out of your check. Or if they say, don't worry, we're not raising taxes. It's fine. Then you're going to like go to the store and eggs that cost $5 a carton two weeks ago. All of a sudden, I went the other day. It was like $10 and something cents a carton. I was like, wait, hold on. What happened here? So these are the things that they're hoping you don't notice. Right. And you kind of like complain about it kind of hurts a little bit right now. And you're like, oh, this is a little tight. This is a little uncomfortable. But but you don't realize why it's happening. But wait, wait five years, wait 10 years, wait 15, 20 years. Because all those people coming over, they're not leaving. They're not leaving. They're not going to go. You know, like, you know, they tell you that, you know, you had some politicians saying they're only coming here for a little bit. You actually had a politician say that. They're coming here for a little bit. I think it was the vice president that said that. They're only coming over here for a little bit. Yeah, right. And I said, to, I said, this is the woman that's a one heartbeat away from running our country and is literally saying, and she expects we're all stupid enough to say, oh, oh, they're only coming here for a little bit. Yeah. Oh, like that's just not real. So to me, that is war. So as a man that has faced racism, you know, you were the only brown guy in an all white place. Um, what are your thoughts on segregation? Like, is it better that we stay with our own kind? I think there's a value in community. I think there's a value in, like, you know, you see in New York, there's certain neighborhoods that are made up of just certain people. Right. Maybe like uh, there's a certain part of Brooklyn that's just Russians. Right. And then there's a certain part of, uh, you know, New Jersey, Edison, New Jersey. Just, it's, real, it's like almost all Indians. There's a value to that to maintain culture. There's also value of 
mixing and getting a melting pot, of course, where you have people from other cultures coming in, you have different foods, you have different backgrounds, you have different identities, you're going to have different religions. And there's a value to that too, because it makes us well-rounded and it makes us in some ways stronger. But I also think there is a value in if you have a culture that you grew up in, like the Indian culture, uh, Asians take their culture very seriously. There's a value in the sanctity of that. Right. And I don't devalue that. I know there's a lot of people who will say, you know, I could say this because I experienced it. My mom experienced it. Oh, you know, that that neighbor, that's, you know, the, the Indians run that neighborhood. That's all the Indians and whatever. Right. And they would say that almost like it's like a bad thing. But the people living in that neighborhood or that area, they just wanted to keep the family values, right. the culture. They wanted to keep that tried and true. And that's why when people come here from India, they automatically gravitate to some of these areas, these little pockets yeah. where their people are because – they're maintaining the culture and the family right. values of the homeland, which is important to them. And I would say that that's real diversity. Real diversity isn't the melting pot. That's the marketplace. That's the, right. Correct. Correct. Right. That's that, now you have a pocket here and a pocket here. Yeah, sure. That's diversity. If you start mixing it all up, the reality is. And I'll just give the example because I, you know, I, I literally saw this. If you have like the, the neighborhood that's, you know, or the part of the city that's all Russians and the whole part over here that's all Indians from India and all the people that immigrate over here from Russia, they go here where their people are. And then we're... now if someone says, hey, we're going to force these two people to mix. Right. We're going to force it. Right. Well, that's what happened during the civil rights movements. Right. And if you if anybody says that, especially brown skinned dudes like us, then you're a sellout. Yes. But that's a good thing where from what I understand that the black community was much better off when it was segregated. They, they, they just the families were stronger, the faith was stronger, the economies were stronger. Yes. That it was the actual mixing, the so called equality that created the problems in the community. And there's a lot of scholars that actually provide evidence to that. There's right. a lot of scholars that actually show that. They, they, you know, someone was talking about it the other day. It was a black pastor, someone from the South. And he said, look at when the breakdown of the black family occurred. Right. Look at when it happened. And it was right around that time. Right. What the, the family unit was strong. The family unit was strong and there was value put on that. And it was people looked at that and people in the black community said, yeah, this is this is this is good. This is what we want, you know, and there was a show on TV when we were growing up. And I want to say what was the name of the show? But it was like the, the dad was like a like a mailman or something. It was a black family. Uh, the show. And oh, with Urkel. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Family matters. Family matters. That's family right. matters. Right. With <laughs> Urkel. Right. And Carl was the dad. Yeah, right, right. Wasn't he like a mailman or I don't know what he was. He was, you know. I think he was a cop. Was he a cop? I think so. Was, yeah, maybe blue collar. Yeah. So you're like, but they always talked about the family. Right. And the family structure. And it was a beautiful thing. Yeah. And you're like, man, that's, you know, that's awesome. Go back a little bit further. One of the most watched shows in American television history. I know it's a little tainted now, but The Cosby Show. Yeah, that's right. The Cosby Show about a family. Black family. A black family. Mm -hmm. Household. Structure. You know, professional parents. Yes. Right? That was that was it. Faith. It was it was all the things that now all of a sudden are like, wait a second, hold on. Hold on. How did that happen? How did that happen? You were thinking all these people pushing diversity and inclusion and all this stuff. And that's what this black pastor was saying. He said what they were thinking was going to help. Did they really think it was going to help? or did, It were they helped certain people. So have you ever heard this <coughs> idea of standardization where we mentioned the marketplace before. So we can all mix in the marketplace, but then go back to our homes. That ultimately, in order for commercial interests to survive, they must have an avatar. And so to keep marketing budgets low... 
they can't just mar- they can't market to this segment of the population, this segment of the population, that segment of the population. What they need is a homogenous mass of people to to deliver the same message to mm. so that they can sell more of their products. So I would propose that a part of this is I love capitalism for what it can bring, but also taken to its diabolical degree. Uh, we're in a situation now where it's, in my opinion, a lot of it is because of profit. We can't, we have to have a different message for different cultures rather than just make everybody think the same, give them the same brainwashing, erase all differences. This is the opposite of diversity, this this homogenization of the culture, and it makes us easier to manipulate. I mean, look at what happened during the pandemic. Nobody thought for themselves. There was some segments of the world i.e. like African cultures, I think also African culture countries and also like uh, Haiti, mm-hmm. where these are, these, they're ho- homogenous, right? Yeah. Is that the right word? So yeah. they are one type yeah. of people. They were not so easily manipulated. People who stay within their own or maintain that one culture separate from the mixed world are harder to manipulate. It's so funny you say that because this was something that I read a lot about and I heard a lot about uh, the Hasidic Jewish community, very tight knit, mm-hmm. very closed off to outside. I mean, they, I mean, it's very, everyone knows that they're within themselves. They're, they don't uh, let outsiders come in and influence. They have their own set of guidelines. They almost have their own like laws within certain communities. And where I live, there was a community called Lakewood, Lakewood, New Jersey. And it's pretty much entirely. Uh, uh, the residents there are almost entirely uh, of the Hasidic Jewish community. And everyone was up in arms because they were refusing the shot in the arm, the jabs for their children, for the, the, the adults. They were refusing it. Right. And everyone said, wait, you, you can't do that. You know, you know, they're, they're all going to die. They're all still there. Right. They're all still there. Right. They, shut out the noise of everyone else coming in. They did not let anyone guilt them. They did not let, they said, we are homogenous. We are one. And we are going to make this decision for ourselves, our children, our families. And everyone was like, these people, are, they're, they're going to be super spreaders. They're this or that. They're all going to be dead. They're all still there. And they wouldn't budge. They so wouldn't budge. you're a Christian man. Yes. I see you wearing your cross. Yes. What happened such that Christians have become, the, the commu- quote-unquote church has become so permeable uh, to manipulation from the culture where you may have Jews or maybe Hindus or others, uh, Muslims, who maintain that, that boundary? What happened to Christians in the West? I think that part of what we're seeing, and it's kind of in line what with what, we're talking about for in the in the name of not letting anyone feel left out and in the name of inclusion what you inherently do is let people in and once they're in you want to make people feel comfortable just like when someone comes into your home you want to make them feel comfortable so at some point once they're in your home they might start saying certain things and saying, well, you know where I come from? You know what I learned growing up as a child? You know what I, in temple or in this faith, this, that? And in the beginning, so not to offend them, you almost kind of let it slide a little bit. And you're like, oh, I, you know, kind of like what if someone was at a dinner party. Is and that a real Christian value? To me, value in a faith, value in anything is standing by what it stands for. Yeah what it stands for. And if at any point you deviate from that for the sake of whatever, inclusion, people's feelings, you know, you know, different agendas by governments or the society, you're weakening it. And you're weakening it for a poor cause and not a just cause. At some point, you have to stand your ground and say, in this building, in this situation, This is the word. And we welcome, we welcome you if you are coming in this door and saying, I am lost. I have no word. I I didn't really come from anything like that. 
and I want to become this and believe this and go down this path. That's one thing. But if you're coming in that door saying, you know, I lived in India, I studied some Buddhism, I, I was a monk for, a, I, you know, I stayed in a mountain retreat for a week, silence, so I got a little bit of this, and, you know, and then I studied Judaism, and I studied, and you're, and you're one of those people, we see a lot of those people these days, because they feel like, because they know a lot of religions, and they've traveled a little bit, or they've been on YouTube a little bit, they feel like they're worldly, and then they want to come in, and what's, a short time later, what are they doing? There's you know, I don't know if I agree with that. Right. You know, I don't know if that's an absolute truth. Right. And you're well, like this new uh, marriage act. Uh, from what I understand, the big difference is the amount of religious persecution that is in this new uh, act or law, or however they want to call it. Because now the Christians that say no, I'm not going to do business with people who are sinning. I'm not going to do business with people who are living a lifestyle outside of that which I believe is in, within the natural order. They now can be persecuted. I didn't. I didn't. I don't That's know. That's the I, big difference oh, now. Is that that by difference? law you cannot practice your faith any longer. No, kidding. your business will be fined. You could be arrested. And so ultimately, it seems as if you know all this diversity inclusion is for whatever's disordered, but the those who want to maintain natural law and moral standards i.e christians particularly in the west are actually the classes being most persecuted and ostracized and that's the work of the devil yeah and so when you said earlier yeah this is this is satan's plan absolutely yeah i i mean yeah I'm, people may not agree with me that's my personal feeling but once again it's all these little things, all these tiny things that are slowly happening that they're hoping go unnoticed. But it's those little things that happen over the course of 5, 10, 15, 20 years that next thing you know, you wake up one day and you look around and, you're, and people are saying, how did we get here? Right. How did this happen? You know, the teenager that acts out, ends up, you know, when they're 15, 16, ends up, you know, doing drugs and acting out and doing all, you know, go crazy, right? I know a couple of families and friends that have had that. They've had that experience with a child go off the rails, right? And I know they've had that talk. They sit down with their wife. Their kid is in jail. Their kid's in rehab. And they're like, mind you, on the phone, on the shelf, there's a picture of the kid when he was seven, and he's like, he looks like an angel, you know, he's got his soccer ball picture, foot on the ball, and holding the trophy, and they're like, man, how did this happen? As if it happened overnight. Right. It didn't. There was a series of things that you didn't stand by steadfast, that you allowed all along the way, and maybe some of those things you allowed because you you didn't want to hurt their feelings, right? And maybe you wanted to have them feel included and you wanted to have them feel whatever, like you were their friend or whatever. And you didn't stand by the word of the house. Right. That's a dereliction of authority. That's right. That's right. And then it went and it went and it went. And the next thing you know, you're standing there. You're sitting at the kitchen table with your wife. Your kid's in jail. Your kid's in rehab your kids in some other worse situation and you're you're saying honey how did this happen <laughs> what do you mean how did this happen let's let's play the tape let's play the tape let's go back five ten years mm -hmm. and we'll show you how it happened and then if you lay it out that's when they say oh but we didn't really think that was just like a little thing we didn't really think oh, well that was just a little thing well that was no big deal well, what about this thing? Oh, that, that, you know, lots of parents do that. We didn't think. Fast forward. Right. So these are the things we have to be mindful of and cognizant of when it comes no. to faith, when it comes to family. It has to be the word and the rule. And we see, I'm sure you see it, a lot of people, with, we're seeing it with religion because now there's the people who are like, and you and Rich talked about this. There are people who are like, what's your religion? What's your faith? Oh, I believe a little bit of everything. You know, I believe a little bit of this, yeah. a little bit of this. I'm a little bit of this. I'm part this. And you're like, what? 
you know that's not how it works right, right. <laughs> like, you know that's not how it works it's either you're here or you're saying nope I don't believe that. That's not, no, I'm over here. And it's fine. You know, uh, this is what I believe. And I believe all the structure and the word of this right here. And it's not a la carte like the steakhouse where you're like, oh, I'm going to do a little bit of this. Oh, let me right. do this. No, it's, you, you're in. Just like in your home. Right. When you come into the home, into my home, these are the rules. Right. There's a tradition. I would like to propose that a lot of this destruction uh, within the faith began with Martin Luther. And at that moment when he decided, I'm going to break off and create my own church, we now have 36,000 different interpretations of the Bible now. So Christianity doesn't actually even mean anything because like you are proposing as well, uh, now we get to pick and choose. I think the Bible says this. And like Martin Luther, I don't like these books in the Bible, so I'm going to get rid of these. And so I would just say that uh, the faith began losing itself and its strength and its structure 500 years ago. And now we have it here now where guys like Andrew Tate uh, will just openly disrespect Christianity because, well, Christianity hasn't stood on its own feet for a very long time. And you ask yourself, how does a man like that garner such a following? He garners such a following if the word he is speaking is accepted by the masses. Because Andrew Tate, going back, I don't know, how, let's go back however many years you need to go back, there was a time where the things he was saying, well, you go back far enough, he would have been killed. You go fast forward a little bit more, maybe he would have been thrown in prison. And you go back a little bit further, you maybe would have just been, you know, kind of ostracized a little bit. And you keep going forward. You keep going forward. You keep going forward. And next thing you know, He's a superstar. He's a celebrity that people are like, this guy, man, I'm, you know. And it's hard because you have this society of men who are lost. They don't have the structure, whether they don't have the, the father in the family, the father wasn't playing a role, and they feel less than. We talked about this. There's no rite of passage here in this Western culture. What's the rite of passage for a man in America? Well, there's no meaning. There's no like a rite of passage means you're passing into something, but really what we're passing into is fornication, drugs, video games, uh, being a big boy living at home with your mommy. Yeah, that's that's the culture. So he capitalized on that. He saw that, and he said, "I have this culture that I'm in where there's these." what I call arrested adolescents. They're by age men, but by life they're adolescents and they're lost, they're weak, and they need direction. So what did he, he's like, I, I noticed this. So I'm gonna start a university. I'm gonna start a program. And if you are weak, you're lost, you're this, you don't, you know, women don't talk to you, all this stuff, all the, and it was a lot of it was material, you're broke, you know, all this stuff. Sign up, I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach you how to become me. Is this possible in a world where faith is strong? No, no. If you have a strong faith and you have a strong family, mm. family structure, like the, the logo for 221B uh, is an F and a B combined. That's a new logo. Uh, it's on our website. And it's a combination of the F and uh, the number three, rather, but it looks like a B. And people, when they ask now, the people are starting to see it. They're like, What's the, what, what is that? Is it B? Is it an F? Is it a number three? I said, it's an F and a three for the three Fs. Faith, family, freedom. Those are the foundations. When you have strong faith, Within a strong family structure, you have the ultimate freedom. You're not listening to charlatans. You're not, you know, easily influenced by social media influencers because you know, I don't need that. I don't need that. I have the faith in myself. I have my faith. I have my family. I don't need drugs. I don't need to drink. I don't need to sit there and watch porn. I don't need to sit here and, you know, go to strip clubs. I don't, I don't, like, I don't need all that. The strongest men I know, 
and the most powerful men I know don't do any of that stuff. And you look at that and you're like, why is that? They don't need to. They have such a strong foundation in their faith and in their family and in their own internal structure that they don't have those weak breakdowns that lead them down that road. People who go down that road, it's because they're having breakdowns in some foundation in their world. And that's the outlet. That's the release or that's the place where they think they're going to find some sort of resolve. That's why they do it. There's some sort of, it's like the people who, when they wake up in the morning, the first thing they do is they roll over to the nightstand, grab their phone, and they lay in bed, whatever, right? Why do people do that? They want that dopamine fix, and they want to what? Let me go to that thing I posted last night and see how many people liked it. Let me see if anyone commented it. It's validation. That's the validation. Right, because but, we don't have that validate, validation from our fathers and God the Father. That's right. But when you have all that, when you have a structure in your world, I, I use this example because it's something people can relate to. But when everything is in order in your home and you have that strong mind, that strong body, that strong faith, that strong family unit, you're waking up and you're not looking to that electronic device and the affirmations of strangers on a, on, a, on a device that connects you to the rest of the world, you don't need that. Your feet hit the ground and you say, okay, for me, meditation, prayer, start my day. How am I going to structure my day to stay on the path? That's it. That's the only thing that matters. You don't need all that other stuff. People who don't have that and they don't have that structure, that form, they're weak. And what do they do? Do you believe that men need religion? Yes. Women need religion. Children need religion. I think that I tell people this. Someone asked me the other day. They said, we don't know about public school for our child. And uh, I said, I said, what do you think about? Yeah, he, was talking, he said him and his wife were having a discussion because they, they were a little concerned about some of the things that were happening in public school, teachers, you know, different you know, messages that were going out. I said, so what do you guys think about? Well, uh, there was a you know private school <clears throat> that we we're thinking about, and uh, or maybe homeschool, but you know we we both work, we have to get like a, you know tutor, it would be a big disruption. And I said, okay, and they're like, well, and, and there was this uh, there was this um, Catholic school, got great reviews, great ratings. Talked to some parents whose kids go there, but you know we really don't know about like the whole religion thing. I'm like, what? I said, what do you mean? And he's, oh, you know, we want her to go there because it's a good school right. and it's good teachers and good education. But once a day, there's religion. Right. They want the milk. They don't want the cow. You hit it on the amen. And I said, <laughs> I said, I said, what you're saying doesn't make sense right now. Right. It makes no sense right now. I said, what do you mean? You just you just said, I said, why do you think that school has those teachers? And they have those children that are graduating going to Ivy League schools. And the alumni of that high school, they, they're looking back and they're like, you know, leaders in their community. And, right. you know, why? They would have to amend their life. And that's the problem with most people. They want the fruits of the Holy Spirit. They want the gifts from God, but they don't want to give up their sinful lifestyles. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. And like you said, they want the reward, but they don't want to do the work. And that's the story of our society. Let's face right. it. Like people want, that's why you have so many people who never went back to their job after COVID because they're like, you know what? Nine to five, office, boss. All that stuff, meetings. You know what? I think I'm going to be an Instagram influencer. Yeah, OnlyFans. OnlyFans, <laughs> YouTube. And I, every day when I'm on Google and, you know, you go to Google to look something up, almost every day there's a story of teacher fired after kids find out that she has an OnlyFans page. 
parents, uh, parents, uh, whatever, ousted after uh, school board finds out that the husband and wife have an OnlyFans page. And I'm like saying to myself, this is the world we're living in. But that is what? That noticing and that creation is the work of a higher power that's trying to push you off that path. Right. Hey, look. Hey, look, look at that over there. And we're weak. We're weak because we have no faith. That's we right. have no stability and foundation in Christ. That's right. And when you have that, the stronger that is, I, th- I tell people, the stronger your faith is, you see the thoroughbreds, right? The thoroughbred horses that race. Sometimes they have these the blinders on. And they have those blinders on because that's how horses can't see in front of them. Horses, they only see this way, right? And they have the blinders on when they're the jockey's riding them. Part of it is so they don't see what is happening over here. They're just – and so once this is closed off, they just got to go straight. And they just got to stay on the path they're on. Anything over here, anything happening over here can't distract them. The stronger your faith, the bigger your blinders. The weaker your faith, the shorter the blinders. Yeah, more distractions. More distractions, and you're seeing more of the distractions. They're coming into your world. So whatever that power that is coming against and working against us, its primary goal is to what? Shorten or and or eliminate our blinders so we could see all. And the path that's in front of us, the path that we belong on, well, well, yeah, it's a path, but I can go that way too. I go, yo, hey, look at that over there. Right. Remove the blinders. Then faith keeps the blinders on. And when you don't see, even if you know when you don't see, the temptation is less. That's crazy. One of the things my dad would always say, he said, I just don't want to know. And it's kind of crazy because we worship information in our culture, especially today when it's so easily access- accessible. Um, we, You and I grew up without the internet. Yeah. And I could tell you that I started losing my marbles when I started, when I got a smartphone. I, 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 I can sense the demarcation between the sense of peace and focus that I had in my life when I didn't have access to so much information. So it almost sounds counterintuitive because there's such a pleasure in knowing but at the same time, it's confusing. So I, I would even propose to say that there is a holy ignorance that would be well worth our return to. Like, I just don't need to know. I don't want to know. I want to be close-minded. Some people say that about me recently, and I venerate that idea. I say, yeah, I'm close-minded because people's minds are so open that their brains are just falling out. Yeah. They're just taking anywhere in any which way. And they're easy. Mo- I don't want to know nothing but one thing and one thing only. I got one destination, and I'm carrying my family with me. We're going straight to heaven. And if we keep our focus on that, that's how the saints were created. These were that's men right. who said, look, I'm forsaking any and all things except my vocation and my ultimate location. Yep. That's it. And that's the We ul- don't even think about death today. No. It's all this YOLO lifestyle. No. people. People are... People are so focused on, like, you know, you see these people, they're doing these stunts on Instagram for likes and stuff like that. I'm like, these people are like, there's completely no value for life in some cases anymore. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, there's no thought about the consequence to decisions. Like when you and I were growing up, like, like before I did something, I thought, in my mind, because my home, my structure, and the, the faith that was brought upon, what could potentially happen to me if I do this, right? right? And I made mistakes as a young man. Oh, I yeah. did. But <laughs> you see what's going on today, and there's no regard for decisions that are being made. Right. And so now, it's at first it was like maybe doing stupid stuff. But now look, talk about the mixing and the diversity right now and i and i say this and i'm not i'm not trying to be disrespectful but i was out in a public setting recently and i i'm, I'm usually not in like big public areas whatever but i was in i was in a situation i got invited to something i was in a big public setting i was walking through this big public area and there were so many young individuals that i walked past and I was thinking it, 
But then the person I was, and, but I didn't want to say it. I didn't want to say it. But then the person I was with was like, that person that walked by us, was that a boy or a girl? Right. And I said, you know what? Since we've been here, I've asked myself that question about 15 times. I literally couldn't tell. These people were walking past me, young people, and I couldn't tell if it was a young man or a young woman. I, I, it, I was, and, and I'm sitting there saying to myself, this wasn't my how I grew up when I, you know, I'm like, like I said, I'm not saying there's anything wrong there, but I'm saying to myself, something is happening. Something is different. Some people say, ah, oh, it's a hormones in the food. Some people say, oh, it's this. When you create the confusion, right. it's very easy. When you create the confusion, it's really easy to go off the path. Right. And there's no sense of remorse, guilt, shame uh, because of these lack of boundaries that are so openly accepted that now the predominant quote unquote virtue, which is ultimately the number one vice, is pride. Yes. And so you see all these people who are living completely disordered lifestyles. And not only do they not have a sense of shame, but it's proud. I'm, and not only am I proud, but you must celebrate me too. Yes. And that is the first. Let me, I don't want to say that's the first line we cross, but it's one thing for me to say, uh, I live down the street from you. And I'm a man, but on the weekends, I like to dress up as a woman and go out to the bar. And I know you're my neighbor, but I just want to let you know, just in case you see me, that's that's what I do. And you might say, all right, bro, <laughs> you do you. Yeah, I'm going to be here with my family. You do you. Right. And that, that, there was a time where that, that's where it ended. Right. Right. There was a time where I would do that and I didn't even tell you. But now there came a time where it was like, I feel empowered enough to tell you. And you're like, okay, cool, bro. You do you. But then it goes a little further where it's now, hey, you know, my wife said she was talking to your wife and your son, like, put on your wife's, like, shoes or something. You should let him dress up as a girl one day a week. Mm -hmm. Just let him do and it. And if you don't. And if you don't own shame on you, then you're the bad guy. Right. Right. <laughs> and then it goes a little further. It goes a little further and it says, well, I am now going to come to your child's school and I'm going to do story time dressed as a girl. And I'm going to let all the kids know that they can do that too. And they should do that. And they should whatever, whatever, causing just a little bit more confusion as if kids are, aren't confused enough growing up in this world. And if you are against that, if you go to the PTA meeting and you say, whoa, hey, okay, listen, this guy's my neighbor. And I was okay with him doing that on a Saturday night by himself. And then he tried to say like, yeah, I should give my kid a chance. I kind of was like, mm -hmm. and then they started like reading to the kids at school. And I was like, ah, oh, now they're sitting. Now I'm here at the PTA meeting saying, hey, hold on a second. What's going on? And now all of a sudden, you're the jerk. Yeah. You're the one who isn't accepting. You're the one who isn't inclusive. And you're saying, hey, I was okay with him doing him. Right. Now this is like affecting me and you're forcing this on me and my kid. And what's next? You're going to make me dress up as a girl? Like, I'm okay with that if that's what you do. But- once you start saying that I have to do it or he has to do it or I need to accept, then you, that is the epitome of, and that's the definition of what? Anarchy. There are no rules. Right. You can't have rules for yourself. Well, hey, this is my house and my, my rules are this and this is how I raise my family. And if now someone from the outside says, your rules are wrong and you're not raising that kid properly. And you, that's where some serious breakdowns occur. Yeah, it's totally backwards, upside it's, down world. And and I think it I think it was I think it was Long Island where they had that board of ed meeting and that one politician said uh parents coming here thinking they know what's best for their children right. is not acceptable. And he was on the news. He made the news. I heard that. I was like 
Did this dude lose his mind? Did he just sit here and say to a group of parents that they don't know what's best for their children? We, as random board of education people, administrators, know what's best. But you're right, man. You said before, it's been a long time coming because prior to the world wars uh, and the so-called feminism, uh, women raised their children. And the children were at home uh, being schooled. Uh, and we didn't give away our children to the state. And so in a lot of ways, we're complaining. But at the same time, we decided to bite that apple and say, oh, we're going to work two jobs, two people. Yeah. And we're going to send this, send the kids to be indoctrinated by the government. Because, of course, they must know better than us. Right. And so there's a pushback now. But ultimately... It's been a long time coming when we made this decision. And what are you seeing now? Now you're seeing a shift to people saying, going back to homeschooling the kids. Going back to homeschooling yes. the kids. And now they said public school enrollment is down something like 30-something percent. Yeah. And it keeps going down. Why is that? Because more we're going backwards. Yeah, that's the only natural path yes right the pendulum has to swing back right and so it's just going to be uh as crazy as it can be on one end of the spectrum but on the other end there's a movement back home and i'm excited about it. i love it i love it and you know what we're also seeing more of as these people are bringing their kids back to homeschool because they're they don't want this woke craziness in in their children's world so many parents that i've talked to that said hey we're we're homeschooling now are also doing what? Going, faith. Going to church. That's what I was going to say. Faith. Yeah, there's a movement back to Christ. And that's what has to happen. It has to happen. Paul says that as darkness abounds, uh, grace abounds that much more. And it is, it's no mis it's no accident. When people see disorganization, we as humans want organization. We yeah, want security. Order. And we want order. We don't want disorder, right. right? In chemistry, we talk about, you know, there's this this whole period, and entropy and enthalpy, but uh, that's organic chemistry talk for order, disorder. But we want order. And you know what? There's some people who I know that they haven't been to church in a long time. But now all of a sudden they're like, we're homeschooling and we're going to church. Why? Because they, they see the craziness in the world and they're like, we need some order here. We need some structure here. That's right. And they see that as they see faith as structure and yeah. order. In a way, a lot of this has been a grace from God calling back his children. Otherwise, we would have continued to be lost in the world. I know that has been a big part of my reversion, just seeing the order in my disorder in my own life and realizing I'm not oriented to anything higher than myself. And of course, returned to the faith and gave my life to Christ, homeschooling the kids and Making that way back home, man. Yeah, and you know when you go through hard times, I went through. I mean, I, I was. I, I mean, people know my story. I ultimately was. I had a 13 year career as a police officer. Served my community proud. I was. Everyone in the community knew me. Everyone loved me, and I was. A, but I had to deal with someone who didn't like the color of my skin, and I was in an all white department. And ultimately, they the the head of that department. It's my belief, because of the color of my skin, did everything in his power to get rid of me. And he ultimately did. They ultimately paid the price for what he did. The town did. Um, but the damage is done. The monetary settlement that I received for that man's actions and some other people's actions in that town, um, that doesn't erase the, the pain and the suffering mm -hmm. they caused me. But... They put me in such a hole, in such a place that the only thing that could get me out of that hole was faith. So, like you said, sometimes these things happen because they need to happen. Mm -hmm. And when you get that that rock bottom, you know, I know quite a few people who are some pretty serious addicts. And it wasn't until they hit rock bottom like almost died, that OD that almost took their heart, whatever, mm -hmm. that they found God. Yeah. They I think our whole society is there right now. That's right. So you now have your own business, man. Tell us a little bit about uh, what kind of work you do and the business that you got. Uh, yeah. So 10 years into my career, I uh, was sweating, wearing my bulletproof vest, 
<coughs> and uh, I was like, man, there's got to be a solution to this. Yeah. So I had my science background. You know, um, I, I didn't go into medicine. I, I tried to go into the Navy to become a SEAL. And my buddy had become a SEAL that I went to high school with. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do after 9-11. Go fight for my country. My mom said, I'll kill you. So I, behind her back, went and uh, <laughs> left medical school and uh, uh, the, the medical program I was in. And I went to um, uh, the police force. Um, and, uh, ten, you know, 13 year career, 10 years in, uh, this concern for being hot and sweaty and uncomfortable while wearing the bulletproof vest, uh, developed a material, got a patent and, uh, created this thing called the max dry vest. You wear it under your body armor and it allows heat to escape and cool air to get in. And it was just, you know, using my brain to solve a problem, you know, it was a mother invention necessity. And, um, that led to a whole series of innovative products you know needle resistant gloves that you could actually shoot your gun with that would protect your hands from needle sticks and cut resistant gloves uh silver infused clothing that wouldn't build bacteria so when you're wearing it for a long period of time uh you don't get the the rashes and the bacterial infections things like that so all things that i suffered from as a police officer that there weren't solutions for i created and i started in my garage without like two nickels to rub together. Uh, and I built it from my garage all the way up to now our headquarters is in New York City. Wow. We're in over 250 retail locations worldwide, uh, 70 different countries around the world. Uh, we have police departments and government agencies, all 50 states using our product. And, um, you know, it's, it's the exact opposite of the narrative that is out there. Yeah, there's going to be hurdles. Yeah, I, I I hit a real bad speed bump. I had little bumps of racism, and then I hit a bad bump of racism that derailed me and put me in a really bad place. And that was real racism, not that plant is racist or that red hat is racist. No, real racism. Racism <laughs> is when someone denies you an opportunity because of the color of your skin, and they gave that opportunity to someone else. That's racism. Racism isn't, oh, that flag is racist, that, that, that checkerboard is racist, you know, right? So the, the, the term racist has been watered down to the point where it means nothing no, anymore because they just throw it at people. Right. Um, so I dealt with those things, but I overcame them using the strength of my family and the fam family that took me in and helped introduce me to Christ and religion and also the structure that my mom put forth as a single mom and that and faith got me out of those situations, helped me get past those situations to start a business and grow a company, become a CEO of now a worldwide corporation. And so when I hear that there's this racism in the ether now, and you now we're going back many years ago, I think there's less now than there was. Right. And you know, I say, as a man that looks like me, I can't think of a university I can't go to, a building I can't walk into, a restaurant I can't go into, a gym I can't walk into, a movie theater I can't walk into, I, I, a hospital that won't treat me. It, anything I want to do right now in this country, looking the way I do, I can do. Even start a business in my garage with no money and turn it into a multi-million dollar organization that is now operating worldwide. Amazing. So how racist is America? How racist is it really? Where, because uh, if, if America is really racist, I'm not, a guy who looks like me is not doing that and not building what I built. Adversity is gonna happen to anyone, anyone. Adversity is gonna happen. And I see people of all different things being treated differently. I see people who are fat being treated differently because they're fat. And we see it, you know, we see some people of different faiths being treated differently. You can use it as a crutch and an excuse to be a victim. Or you can say, oh, you know what? Good try. Oh, that one hurt. Good try. But no, not today. Just like when it comes to these things that we talked about that are trying to take you off the path. Oh, that was a good try. That's Satan. Hey, good one. I know. I s dropped that thing over there. Mm-hmm. And all these guys went, mm-hmm, not today, not today. And when the, the racism hit me and the things that probably would have taken most weaker men down, I was like, all right, that hurt. That's, that sucked. That hurt. And that's wrong. But 
I'm not going to let it keep me down. I just stepped higher, 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 and anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. So in a country where the narrative is the whole country is racist, everything's racist, this is racist, that's racist. When a few years ago we had a black president, but somehow everything's racist, and the people crying everything's racist and the system is racist, systemic ra racism, well, they're all the ones running the system. They're all the system, right? right. They're running the system. <laughs> right. You know, for the last couple of years, they've owned the system. So, and then when you talk about media and everything, they own the system. So it's funny. It's funny. And I said, it's, it's all lies. It's all lies. And I am proof that it's possible. I have friends that made it to the NFL. It's possible. Successful business owners and entrepreneurs. It's possible. Unless you say, yeah, that's, I'm a victim. Oh, yeah, that took me down and I can't do anything else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Can uh, just normal people, not you know, just officers or military, buy your products? Yeah, open to the civilian. Yeah, so we think, you know, now we have plate carriers, body armor, uh, you name it, a full nice. line of products. And What's we, your website? 221BTactical.com. Nice. And uh, you know, on Instagram, Facebook, at 221BTactical. Um, and then, uh, you know, my personal stuff is, uh, on Instagram is Suresh underscore actual. And then, uh, uh, TikTok is a situation with Suresh and same with YouTube. And so I try to, I've tried to now separate some of my personal views from the, you know, the business stuff. Yeah. Good move. Um, and just to keep it clean and, uh, you know, we've experienced some, you know, shadow banning and stuff. Cause we sell tactical gear and stuff right. like that. And, you know, I mean the citizens, they don't want people prepared, right? They don't want people ready. They don't want people prepared. So, and I get that. So, Hey, listen, play the game, you know, and mm -hmm. just continue to fight back, you know, slow and steady. And, um, everything that is trying to take you off the path, you got to just double down, to double make down, you stronger. double down, keep the blind. And if they, if they pull the blinders back, then you have your two hands, put your two hands up. And That's put right. your two hands up and replace the blinders that they're trying to pull away and break away. Holy ignorance. That's it. That's it. Just just keep keep going. Keep down. And anything is possible. And I'm I'm proof. And there's plenty plenty proof. Black billionaires, black multimillionaires, black CEOs like myself, all over the country. And they're just they're crying this narrative to make people feel like victims and weak and to even cause more divide. Because they're not only saying that you can't do it, they're saying you can't do it because he's making, preventing you from doing it. He is preventing you from doing it. So they're saying you can't do it and it's because of them. And what does that cause? Divide. Well, now you hate him, you hate her, and you hate the people and the man and the, you know. It's a dangerous game, but not today. They didn't get me. And the strongest ones, the strongest ones with the strongest faith and the strongest family have that foundation. And that's the importance of it. And I came from a home without a father. And I say to this day, I can't imagine where I'd be if had I had a father. And the importance of a mother and a father in a home, I can't, I, I, I can't even tell you what percentage of our society's problems would be erased today if that was still a foundation of this country. Mother at home taking care of the children. Father going to work, no need for two incomes to survive just to buy some bread. If that was our f structure, we would have a different country. We'd have a different world. Yeah. And uh, like you said, it's kind of going back to that now. And yes, I, sir. it's a beautiful thing. I love it. Yes, sir. I love it. You know, so uh, I, I just hope it continues. Suresh, this has been awesome, dude. I yeah, really appreciate man. you. Yeah, I love it. This was this is amazing. I was so glad to reconnect with you. And we're going to see each other again at yes, that's the Protector right. Summit, uh, Full Spectrum Warrior Protector Summit coming up first week of February. That's right. And uh, another good good man, Patriot Rich Graham. Uh, you know, great, great man. So uh, I look forward to this. has been amazing. Thank you for the opportunity, brother. You got it. See you then. And see you guys next time. Done.